Right, we now come on to um, uh, Professor David Malone. He's, at, uh, he's, he's a mathematician at, at Maynooth University's Hamilton Institute. He isn't actually a professional astronomer, but if you want a password designed that will take till the end of the universe to crack, then David is definitely your man. That is his day job. When he was at Trinity, he was looking for, uh, as, as an undergraduate, or was it a postgrad, I forget, he was looking for a computer and they said, oh, you can use this one, David. And it <laughs> turned out that this computer was the clock server for Ireland. So he was totally in charge of uh, all the clocks in Ireland to keep keeping time. And that is when it occurred to him that he ought to go a little bit deeper into time and discover what it actually is. And having discovered it, he's now going to uh, give us the benefit of his wisdom. So David, thank you very much for joining us from uh, Maynooth and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks everybody for coming along this evening. I'm going to talk this evening about how to tell the time. As Peter was saying, uh, as an undergraduate, I was helping looking after computers in Trinity, and I ended up looking after a computer which was listed as a time server for Ireland, whatever that meant. People use it for keeping uh, the clock set on their computers. And sometimes that's for business purposes, but sometimes it's for astronomical purposes. So, for instance, the people who have the Meteor Observation Network use this computer to set their clocks. But as Peter said, I got interested in what did it mean to be a particular time. And so this evening, what I want to try and tell you, I'm going to take a quick note before I move on. So I've got about half an hour trying to explain to you what this bit at the bottom of my slide here means. So it's 2021. It's the fourth month. That's April. It's the 12th day. And we all kicked off here this evening at 20. That's the hour. Zero minutes, zero seconds. Of course, we started very precisely. IST, Irish Standard Time. So what I want to tell you is what each part of that date means. A lot of this is a mixture of uh, astronomy and sort of historical accidents. So I want to tell you a little bit about how those fit together as we go along. So let's start with the year. I'm going to start with the year and then do the month and then do the day and then work down to the hours, minutes and seconds and see what happens. 2021, that's the year. So before I can tell you 2021, it must be, there must be 2021 years, whatever they are, have passed since some time. So first I need to tell you what a year is. So if you come to the earth and you hang around on the earth for a bit, you'll notice, well, in Ireland, the weather gets better and worse during the year. Maybe not a lot better or a lot worse, but it does change from year to year. And maybe even a clearer thing that happens is our days get shorter and our days get longer. This is kind of important. It's very important to our ancestors, but even in today, it's important to us. People who grow food or look after animals, they need to know what the weather's going to be like. And uh, when we can all move around, we want to know what the weather's going to be like in order to plan when do we have our summer holidays, when do we need to be indoors when it's warm. Now, if I was there with you in person, I would have a globe to show you what was going on here. So I'm going to have to try and explain it a little bit with the globe. Why do we get this different weather? Why do we get different length days? And the answer is, you might think, well, maybe we're close to the sun and that makes us warmer. That turns out not to be the answer. If you try, if you have any friends or relatives in Australia, you can try phoning them in the middle of our summer and you can ask them, how is their summer? And they'll answer you in a very confused way and say, it's winter here. So at the t while it's summer in Europe, it's winter in Australia. And Australia and Europe are basically the same distance from the sun. So that's not the explanation. And what you have to do is you have to look a bit more carefully at the Earth. And it's actually tilted at an angle. And as it goes around the sun, something very strange happens. The angle of tilt doesn't change. The Earth turns and the Earth goes around its orbit. But the, uh, essentially, the Earth's axis stays pointing in the same direction. Now, this is due to some bit of physics, and it's usually called conservation of angular momentum, what's going on here. But that's not really important. The important thing for our weather is that the Earth's axis points the same direction all year. And in fact, that's what causes our seasons. One end of the Earth is pointed towards the sun at one time of the year, so the north end is pointed towards the sun in the summer, and in our summer, and the south end is pointed towards uh, away from the sun then, 
and the Australians have their winter. So we have various special names for when the Earth is pointing right at the sun, that's called a solstice. And when the Earth is pointing neither towards nor away the sun, it's perpendicular. The, when the Earth's axis is perpendicular to the sun, that's called an equinox. And the equinoxes are when we get days and nights that are the same length, and the solstices are when we get our longest and shortest days. And so our calendar is somehow trying to track this because, well, we don't really care about the angle between the sun and the Earth's axis, but we care about things like the weather and the length of the day. So we're trying to track this angle, even though we don't really think it's that. And this tracking turns out to be a little bit complicated. So the modern number for how many days it takes for us to go from one equinox to another is 365.24219 days. And that's nothing like a whole number of days. So you have to be a bit careful if you're counting it. You just can't count 365 days and say you're back where you are because you're out by about a quarter of a day. So this is kind of the problem that the calendar is trying to solve. It's trying to count when it's summer, when it's winter, and uh, give us a way of tracking that. So let me maybe show you some pictures which will be easier to see. So this picture here, you can see this is a globe you can see the Earth is tilted in this picture, and you can see the arc around the edge there of the globe. That's, this is the case where we're at the sun, we're looking out at the Earth, we can see the arc around the edge is perpendicular to what we're looking at. It's like it, it's on a page in front of us. And you can see Ireland up the top there. This is what Ireland looks like to the sun on the equinoxes. Now, if we wait for a little bit during the year, because the Earth is moving round us, we keep following it, and eventually the Earth comes to a point where the axis is pointed straight at us. Now here you can see we've got a slightly better view of Ireland. You can see it up here. And we, it's kind of tilted towards us, us being the sun in this case. And so Ireland gets warmer days when this happens. And then if you wait all the way around the other half of the year, there would be another bit where you get another equinox and it would be perpendicular. But during our winter, now the axis is facing directly away from us, and you can barely see Ireland up the top here. And that's why we get our window. The, sun, it, the sun's rays are really just sort of glancing off the country during the days in the summer, and we don't get any light, of course, at night at all. And this is, what, this is the effect that we're trying to track with the calendar. So you could look at this in a slightly different way. This is looking at the solar system from above. The blue circle here is supposed to be the Earth's orbit. And the little yellow dot in the middle, I think if I do that, you can probably see it slightly more better. There's a little blob there. That's supposed to be the sun. I've made some effort to put this to scale, but it's not quite right. And you can see these arrows here where it says solstice up here. That's our winter solstice when the Earth's uh, axis is pointing away from the sun from us. That's the North Pole is pointing away from the sun. Here we get two equinoxes. And down here we get another solstice. But at this solstice, the Earth's axis is pointing directly towards the sun, and that's what's giving us our weather. Perihelion is when we're closest to the sun. Actually, that's during our winter. It was January 4th this year, I think, maybe January 2nd. But it's always around that time of the year. So being close to the sun is not warming us up very much. And that's because this orbit is almost a circle. And in fact, we're furthest from the sun in our summer. Orbits are usually elliptical. I know this orbit looks almost like a circle. In fact, I've exaggerated the Earth's, Earth's orbit here for effect. The real way the Earth's orbit looks is this, and things are even closer to a circle than you might have thought. So here the sun is really close to the middle, and you can see that the aphelion and the perihelion don't make a big difference. So I've kind of tried to convince you here that a year is to do with measuring which way the Earth is facing in space, and whether it's facing towards the sun or away from the sun. And you have to ask which bit of the Earth is facing towards or away. And in our case, we're interested in the North Pole because we're close to the North Pole. So that's what a year is. We're tracking that. Now, I said the, it was 2021, so 2021 years since. Well, what's it since? Well, this is a bit of sort of accidental history. So we're counting from the supposed year of Christ's birth. How did that happen? So it wasn't that Christ was born, and then everybody said, we need to start counting years now, this is going to be important. It was much later when people started trying to count the years from Christ's birth. 
So a monk called Dionysius was given the job of calculating when Easter was. And this was in what he, called, he decided to call 523 in the year of our Lord. And he produced a, a table of Easter dates going back in the past, according to him, all the way back to Christ's birth. Now, unfortunately, he didn't have the best information to hand. He did a pretty good job, but it looks like he must have been out by about at least four years. Because when they added up all the years and uh, put all the history together, they discovered that Christ would have died in 4 BC. And so Dionysius got something wrong in his Easter calculations. Um, there was also a sort of series of other mistakes here. So initially, when the Easter tables became an important thing that people wanted to know about, they started using these for numbering the years. That was all uh, well and good. And so people then started dating the years before this supposed year of Christ's birth. And uh, they left out year zero. They should have put a year zero in between 1 AD and 1 uh, BC. But unfortunately, they didn't. And that makes the calculation of years in between a little bit more complicated. You might wonder what people did before that. Some people counted from the founding of Rome, which would have been uh, 1 AD would have been 754 years since the founding of Rome. But in fact, that was more than a lot of people needed. What they said was, if a particular king was in charge, they would say it was the fifth year of that king's reign, because everybody knew roughly when the new king took over. And in fact, you still see some buildings and laws and things being dated in this way, where they say who was in charge and what year of their reign it was. So the uh, years, what a year is, is an astronomical thing, but when we count them from, it's kind of a historical accident. Now, let me tell you a little bit more a bit about months next. So this month is April, the fourth month. Uh, what does that mean? Why do we have months? So in a way, it's like when I started talking about years, we said we were going to look up into the sky, we were going to sing, see things like the days and nights getting shorter and longer. The next most important thing in the sky for us after the sun is the moon. And it, the hint is in the name for months. Months are supposed to be to do with the moon. But unfortunately, this has kind of fallen by the wayside. So in the same way you might want to get 365.24219 days in a year, but that's complicated because it's not a whole number of days, the month has the same kind of problem. A month is 29 and a half and then a bit more days long. So what, what do I mean by a month? I mean the time to go from one full moon to the next, essentially. Other calendars are good at tracking the moon, but our calendar is no longer good at tracking the moon. So what we think initially happened with our calendar was the sort of stories say that Romulus, who founded Rome, came up with a 10-month system. So the Romans would have 10 months of the year, which they had named, starting in March, and they would go round 10 months of the year, and then they would wait to get round back to the spring equinox again. And then somebody figured out 10 months is way too short for a year. We can squeeze two whole extra months in there. And by the time Julius Caesar came round, there was a calendar that looked a little bit like this. So they had months called January, February, March, April, May, June, Quintilius, Sextus, September, October, November, and December. So by the time Julius Caesar was there, in fact, the months were pretty much the way we have them today. The thing that wasn't the same was the length of the months. When Julius Caesar arrived, January had 29 days, February had 28, March at 31, 29, 31, 29, 31, 29, 31, sorry, 29, 31, 29, 29. And you might wonder, why are they doing these 29s and 31s? Well, in a sense, they're trying to keep up with the moon. They would like a month to be about 29 and a half days. And so they're cr trying to achieve that. And they could do better if they alternated between a 29 day month and a 30 day month, because if you alternated between the two of those, you get about 29 and a half days on average. That wouldn't be too bad. But in fact, what happened there, what happened was in Roman culture, even numbers are considered unlucky and odd numbers are considered lucky. So of course you want your months to have an odd number of days. That means the Romans can't alternate between 29 days and 30 days because the 30 day months would be unlucky. So what's the alternative? Well, they alternate between 29 and 31 instead. 
of course, this isn't very good for tracking the moon. Um, but you might notice something else a little bit weird. They have organized the calendar to go between these 29 and 31 day months, but they've given one month 28 days. And you might think, what are they trying to do there? Are they trying to fix things up? What's happened here is, if all your months in the year, you have 12 months, and each month has an odd number of days, you will end up with an even number of days in your year, and that will be unlucky. So to make sure your year is lucky, you want it to have an odd number of days, and your solution is one month has to take a hit. It has to be an even numbered month to take the bad luck from everything else. And so February is the hit month, essentially. It's taking the bad luck for the rest of the year. And so the way the calendar is organized is to have most of the days with odd numbers of days, and February ends up with an even number of days. This system is terrible, okay? This is really bad. If you add up the number of days, it doesn't come to anything near 365 days. It's only 355 days. And so the Romans know this is not very good. It doesn't track the seasons well. And so they have to have a fix. They have not just a, a leap day for their calendar. They have a whole leap month. So the system is that when people notice the calendar has got out of line with the seasons, you cut off February between the 23rd and the 24th. And you put in a whole extra month there to get the calendar back in line, line again and then you pick up where you left off at the start of the next year because in this calendar the year actually begins in March. So that was a lot to take in. If you haven't got the details there don't worry Julius Caesar decides this is a mess too and he needs to fix it and so he gets good astronomical advice. He finds out how long is the year. People have good observations at this point. They know that the year is about 365 and a quarter days long so there is a new year, a new rule. They change the lengths of all the months. They go for alternating in 30 and 31 days because that works better. Julius Caesar has won all his battles. He doesn't need luck anymore. So it's okay to have even numbers of uh, days in a month. And he says the rule is going to be one in every four years we give an extra day. And that means that over four years, each year has an average of a quarter of an extra day. And this is going to keep things running smoothly. Now, by the time he does this, there's a lot of fixing to be done. They have one year with 445 days to try and get things in the right order. Uh, then when Caesar dies, they get the leap year rule wrong for a couple of years. But by 8 AD, they've got it all up and running. And we have what we now call the Julian calendar. So the Julian calendar looks like this. The old Roman calendar was 355 days plus an extra year whenever it was convenient. The Julian calendar uh, is fixed up in 45 BC. It gives us a year length of 365.25 days, which is much better. And if you look at what we're looking for astronomically, 365.24219, the gap is now much smaller. We're only out by, well, it's about 0 0.008 of a day every year. So it takes 100 years before you're even getting close to a day out. So this system is really good. Uh, it's adopted in the Roman Empire and people start using it and it behaves pretty well. And so you might think everybody would be happy. And people are happy enough for maybe 100 years. But a bit over 100 years, this calendar is one day out. What do I mean by one day out? I mean the spring equinox is not on the 21st of March anymore. One day people probably don't need to notice. But after 200 years, it's getting up to two days out. And uh, maybe some people notice now that this is drifting. After 1500 years, people have noticed that the 21st of March is no longer the equinox. It's moved by about 11 days at this point. People care about this because when the spring equinox is, determines when Easter is. And celebrating Easter is really important in the 1500s and the 1600s. And if you celebrate Easter on the wrong day, you might be a heretic of some sort. And so you want to keep Easter on the right day. And Pope Gregory takes some advice and reforms Julius Caesar's calendar. And his suggestion is, well, first, the 4th of October in 1582 should be followed by the 15th of October. So there is no 5th of October in 1582 in Rome. A day just skips from the 4th of October up to the 15th. And this gets the uh, calendar back so that the equinox is on the 21st of March, which is what everybody wants to celebrate at Easter on the right day. And there is a new leap year rule. So it says, we have leap years as before, unless it's a century. 
So if the year ends in zero, zero, then we're going to skip the leap year unless the year is also divisible by 400. And if you check, this is the length of year you get, and this is now really close to this astronomical number that we want. So we've got this complicated leap year rule. And amazingly, this is the rule for leap years we live with today. Although none of us noticed because we're, those of us who were alive in 2000, it was a leap year, but it was only a leap year because it was divisible by 400. 1900 wasn't a leap year, 2100 won't be a leap year either. So we have this complicated leap year rule hiding in the background. And why is it there? It's approximating this astronomical number. Now this thing takes a while to catch on around Europe. For us, it doesn't catch on to 1752. And that's to do with, at the same time this is happening, the Reformation is happening, the newly formed Protestant churches don't quite trust the Pope, and they're not sure whether he's trying to trick them into all going to hell or something. And so gradually this reform spreads over Europe. Catholic countries follow quickly, and the Protestant uh, countries more uh, slowly. And of course, we're part of the UK at this stage, essentially. So it doesn't happen here until 1752. Okay, so that is years explained, and that is months explained. I need to explain days to you next. Days are a bit simpler, in a way. Days are due to the Earth turning on its axis. It's going around the sun at the same time. That's a small part of it. The main bit is the uh, Earth going around on its axis. And that results in us facing towards the sun and away from the sun about every uh, 12 hours. And so that's where we get our days from. And different cultures start days at different times. The decision about when you think your day starts is kind of an arbitrary one. So some people start them at sunset. The Jewish calendar does that. I guess in a practical sense, our days start at sunrise when we start getting up and doing our uh, daily business. Midnight is when our calendar starts the days. But there are a group of people who used to start their days at midday. And that was the astronomers. They did it because when you're taking records and you need to write the date in, you don't want the day to change in the middle of your records. So they would change their day at midday because nobody does astronomical observations at midday. And so it was a convenient way to do it. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we start our days at midnight. And as I say, it's the Earth going round on its axis, but you can actually ask two slightly different questions about this. So this is sort of a bit where the astronomy comes in a little bit more strongly. So this is a very simple picture of the solar system from the North Pole. You can see the Earth over here, and I put in a little arrow to show the Earth is turning round on its axis. And the Earth is also going round this way at the same time. So the Earth goes round in this direction, but it also is going round on its axis here. And you can imagine trying to figure out, what does it mean for midnight? How do I know when I'm starting my new day? So one thing you could do is you can imagine that you're lying on the Earth, you're lying on your back, and you're looking out into space. And what you do is you look off to the right-hand direction there, and you think about, I'll find a star, and when I see that star going overhead, I know that star is directly opposite the sun, and I'm gonna use that star to say it's midnight, okay? And this is the kind of observations that astronomers used to do. Astronomers used to be very interested in transit observations, which is this kind of thing. When is a star directly overhead? And so you pick out your midnight star. That's brilliant. You now know an astronomical way to measure when midnight is. Now, it turns out the next day, suppose you go out and you do the same thing. You go out, you set up your telescope, you lie on your back, you look out through the telescope, and you wait for the next day. So the Earth has moved around its orbit a little bit. You wait for that star to be overhead again. So you're looking directly out to the right. You spot the same star directly overhead. You're looking in the same direction. And then you can ask yourself the question, is it midnight yet? And the answer is it's not quite midnight because if you look at the arrow from the center of the sun going out to the uh, center of the Earth, our arrow pointing out to that star is no longer parallel with that. We would like these two arrow arrows to be pointing in the same direction for midnight, so that when the sun is directly behind us. And the reason for this is because we're measuring with respect to two different things. Uh, midnight and midday are kind of measured with respect to the sun, but we can also do, in fact, better measurements out to the stars. The stars are further away from us, so they seem more stable. And so you need to do a correction between how long a day is if you measure it with respect to the stars, and how long a day is if you me measure it with respect to the sun. And these two things are maybe obviously called a solar day, is the one when you make, measure it with respect to a sun, the sun, 
and a sidereal day is one when you measure with respect to the stars. And so astronomers are often converting between these two things, particularly if you both want to know where the sun is and where a star is, you need to know both these things. And astronomers know rules of thumb like the stars get up a little bit earlier than the sun does each day, about two minutes earlier each day as the Earth goes around its orbit. So in fact, today, when people measure what way the Earth is facing, they don't measure it with respect to the sun because of all these things about elliptical orbits and tilted axes make it complicated. Instead, you measure with respect to the background stars, and that gives you much more accurate measurements about which way the Earth is facing in space. Okay, so that is years and months and days. I can actually dispose of hours, minutes, and seconds pretty quickly because they're not astronomical. These things are more historical accidents. So an hour, you get to, by dividing a day into 12 parts. So people used to divide the light part of the day into 12 hours and the dark part of the day into 12 hours. And this actually meant the hours of day and night were different lengths, which was a bit of a mess. But as clocks got better, people decided, well, we should have hours that are the same length regardless of day and night. So when clocks got good enough in about the 14th century, people adopted hours that were the same length, the day and the night, and we had 24 hours in a day. Where did they come from originally? Well, the Roman army used them for watches to uh, keep an eye on camps and things like that. That was adopted by the monasteries and the church, and they used them for deciding what type of prayers to say and what type of services to have at different times. And then they were adopted by our society more generally. So they don't really have a profound origin. 12 is a convenient number of parts to divide something into. Now, as clocks get better, people decide they need smaller amounts of time to be able to measure things more carefully. So the first thing they did was they took an hour and they cut it into 60 parts. So 60 is a lot of parts, so they call these minute divisions of an hour. And so this is where we get the word minute. It's because an hour has been divided into 60 minute parts. And then as clocks got even better again, people found that you could divide a minute into 60 tiny parts, and they call those second minute divisions. And so that's where we get the name seconds from. But again, there's nothing profound about these. It was just 60 was a nice number to divide things into. And so people decided to divide it into 60 parts as a convenient thing. And you had a first set of minute divisions, which gave us minutes, and a second set of minute divisions, which give us seconds. So I've actually dealt, dealt with hours, minutes, and seconds there very quickly. Really, they're just convenient ways of cutting up a day into parts that we can work with. And a day is something astronomical because it's to do with the Earth term. Now, the last part of my date said it was Irish Standard Time. What does that mean? Well, so far I've defined things kind of in terms of midnight. Midnight was where our days started. Uh, but midnight, of course, if you're lying on one bit of the earth, it can be midnight. And if you go and sit on another bit of the earth, it can be midday. So midnight depends where you live on the earth. And for a long time, this made no real difference to people. People lived with the local time that they had. So you would have maybe a sundial or something in your area. You would use that to set your clock off. So you'd find when the sundial said midday, you'd set your clock to midday and off you went and everybody was happy. And that's because people didn't move around very much. But in the 1800s, we get a new piece of technology, which is the train. And suddenly, relatively ordinary people can move around the country quite quickly. And they can go and visit other places. And because the trains run to a timetable, it's important that people start agreeing what time it is. And so it starts to be a bit of tension between the local time that people are used to living with and the time that the railway networks use for setting their uh, timetable. And this comes to a head in 1858. Uh, there's a court case where the court's clock is set to railway time. Uh, this is in Dorchester, in fact. So they start legal proceedings. There's no defendant. They find against the defendant. Ten past the hour, the defendant arrives in and goes, right, I'm ready to defend my case. And they go, we found against you. You weren't here to defend yourself. And he says, but it's 10 o'clock. And so it turns out he's running on local time. And the outcome of this is, in fact, is they decide local time is the right time to use for everything. And so 1858, effectively, local time is legal time. But this becomes a bit more troublesome over time. People are uh, moving around more and more. And in the end, in 1880, there's an act called the Definition of Time Act. It's only about one paragraph long. And it says the legal time in England is going to be Greenwich Mean Time, and the legal time in Ireland is going to be Dublin Mean Time. I think Linda said at the start, there used to be a 25 minutes to one gun in Cork. I must find out more about that. 
but that's because the difference in time between Greenwich and Cork is about 35 minutes. And the people in Cork, when that traditional gun would have been set off, were setting it from either local sundials or local observatories. Now, I was trying to figure out what the local observatory in Cork would have been at the time. I don't think it can have been Crawford Observatory because it's built just a little bit too late. So 1878, I think, is when the Crawford Observatory was built and it had great transit instruments. But the definition of Time Act followed so soon afterwards that I don't know whether it was ever used to provide time to Cork City. If anybody knows an answer to that, I would love to know. So this is kind of where legal time comes in. Uh, Dublin Mean Time was set according to Dunsink Observatory. It's not as far west as Cork is, so it's only 25 minutes different to Greenwich compared to closer to 35 for Cork. So legal time since then, what happened after 1880 in the definition of Time Act? I always hoped we'd discover that Ireland still was running on Dublin time, and so we'd all be entitled to turn up 25 minutes late to everything. But unfortunately, that's not true. So in 1916, we know a lot of things happened in Ireland in 1916. But one of the interesting things that happened was daylight savings time is introduced. And when we put the clocks uh, back for the winter, Ireland moves on to the same time zone as the rest of the UK. So we lose our Dublin mean time as a time zone for Ireland. And instead, Ireland and the UK are both on Greenwich mean time. And after that, we pretty much actually follow the UK. So for instance, in 1923, when the uh, Doyle is set up, and up and running. They say that Ireland is going to operate on Western European time, but there's a footnote at the end of the act which says Western European time is actually Greenwich Mean Time. So there's always a bit of nationalism associated with your time zone. It gives you a bit of pride in what you're doing. We more or less follow the UK. The only time we don't is in uh, the Second World War when the UK does double, double summer time to try and save extra fuel, which means actually if you travel to Belfast from the Republic, you find that the time zone changes you as you go across the border, which is an interesting feature. There was an experiment in 1968 in the UK and Ireland with staying on summertime for the whole year. So they declared that summertime was going to be standard time. And uh, after three years, everybody decided they hated it and gave up on it because it meant the mornings were so dark in the winter. But from that time, summertime is officially standard time in Ireland. So this is why the IST is not actually Irish summertime, it's actually Irish standard time. And since then, the EU has kind of been looking after what time zone we're in. The rules for daylight savings have been set by the EU since about 1986 for us, and it's been coordinated across the EU. So things like train timetables and plane timetables are all easy to deal with. So I was going to tell you a tiny bit about leap seconds, but I think I'm actually probably waffled on for long enough. So I'm going to skip over that, and I will give you my conclusion which is we've had thousands of years at this point of calendar and clock reform trying to really track the Earth's position and understand where we are on the Earth and which way the Earth is facing in space and where the sun is relative to us. And it's really somewhat more complicated than it looks. You might think this was an easy task, but there's a lot of accounting to be done. And I think it's a little bit like Brexit. It sounds like a simple thing to do, but if you want to start adjusting your calendar as your clocks, it's actually a bit more complicated than you might think. Um, so if anybody ever tells you that they have a simple solution to a calendar problem or a clock problem, you should treat it like somebody who thinks Brexit is a simple solution to any problem. So thank you. David, thank you very much. Now, um, I know you skipped over something there that you would really, really like to talk about. Was it milliseconds or something? I was going to tell you a little bit about leap seconds. So leap, sec leap seconds, yeah. Well, leap sec we'll, 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 we'll come back to that shortly. All I'll say at the moment is I was fascinated by two things, David. One of them was that it turns out that Shakespeare was right about Julius Caesar. <laughs> Julius Caesar was not superstitious. Yes. He, he did away with the idea that there was anything unlucky about an even number of days. And I was uh, very interested to see that. And the other thing, uh, I mean, I suppose it's obvious when you think about it, but it wasn't obvious to me that a minute is a minute division of an hour and a second is a second minute division. That's it's brilliant. lovely, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. And another thing I might want to ask you about sometime is astronomers starting their days in, at midday. Linda and Declan will call the questions. I know there are, will be more questions than what we have time for, but I'll leave it up to Linda and Declan. To manage that. So we're we starting with you, Linda. 
Yes, of course. Really enjoyed the lecture. Would have liked it longer, but <clears throat> yes, the, the time flies. <clears throat> Tempest Tutor and all that. Um, um, absolutely brilliant talk, says Michael McCreary. Thank you. Can, I, can time move in more than one direction? Plus, can you explain the equation of time? So the... The time moving in more than one direction, I guess, on the scale we see our lives, no, not really. On more interesting um, relativistic kind of scales, if you're going out either very fast or in very heavy areas, uh, very heavy I mean by in areas where gravity is very strong, time can do slightly weird things. It always goes in the same direction, but it can go at different paces. And so people do have to correct for this in certain circumstances. So the GPS sat system, which is based on knowing the time very accurately, does uh, have to make corrections for the fact that the satellites are moving relatively faster than us and going around the Earth. And you have to correct for that because they, each satellite is an essentially an atomic clock broadcasting the time very accurately. Now, there was a second part to that question there. The equation of time is a correction that you have to make because if you read the time off a sundial and compare it to the time off a clock, like the hours being longer or shorter in the winter, there is another correction that you have to make for that. And it's due to two things. Part of it is the fact that the Earth's orbit is in the lips and the sun is at one of the focal points and not both of them. And so the pace that the Earth goes around the sun is not quite even. That's one thing that you're correcting for. And the other thing that you're correcting for is this angle of the Earth's uh, axis as well. So the equation of time is essentially a correction for the two of those, which takes you from the time on a sundial to the time a clock that paced out equal, equally spaced uh, seconds would tell you. There is a picture of the equation of time and it says, so this is how many minutes you have to correct a sundial for. So a sundial starts about four minutes slow in January. By about April, it's about four minutes fast. And by, uh, I guess that's somewhere around September, a sundial is about 15 minutes fast. So you, if you want to correct your sundial to tell the sign time a mechanical clock would, you have to make these corrections. And the two wobbles are a superposition, essentially, of orbital stuff and axial stuff. Right. Thank you very much. Now, Ted. Ted has a question. You said, and I think I read that before, that the first time uh, we split a day into hours, it was 12. Mm. We, uh, people living in, in science uh, don't like uh, weird numbers like 13, 15, 17.569. Uh, Why not 10? Okay. So... Uh, I read. I once read uh, Isaac Asimov, who could describe uh, weird things very, very fine. He said, "Look, what were at that time? What were twelve? And then comes to me, twelve disciples. Was that a reason? Are the same with theory? why does why does the week have seven days? Yeah, seven planets at that mm. time." There is a bigger thing up there, and we just hook onto it. So the, t the, se the seven days, I think there are two origins for. One is the bib biblical creation story, and mm. the other is the seven planets. Mm. You're dead right. Mm -hmm. um, and they are somehow intermixed with one another. One is sort of a Judeo-Christian thing, and the other one is taken up in the days of our week. You see that a lot of our days of week are named after planets. The 12 <laughs> for the number of hours? Yeah. is uh, a more interesting question. I think it predates the modern biblical stuff. And so I've heard two reasonable explanations. So one is that if you look at Babylonian mathematics, mm -hmm. it deals in fractions. And fractions of 12 are very nice because you can write a quarter as a fraction of 12, you can write a half as a fraction of 12, a third, a fifth you can't, but a sixth you can. So it's a very good number in terms of fractions working out nicely. So this is one possible reason. The other reason is that you can count 12 on your fingers if you know how to do it. So if you hold your hand up like this, you can use this as a pointer and you count the sections of your fingers and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. 
<laughs> so there are people apparently in the world who count like this. If you practice, you can count to 12 on your fingers and you get a pointer as well, which is very convenient. Yeah. So I don't know which is really the true story for the origin of this, but they chose 12 and mm. this is where we have wound up. Could I come in here, Dave, for a moment? Please. Tony Jackson. Um, what I read at some, uh, some time ago, the two units, the 12 and the 60, were commonly used in life mm -hmm. for trading purposes and, say, in markets, for bartering. Take 60 particularly. Uh, start off with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. They're all multiples of 60. 60. Yeah. So you're bartering. There's great combination there for so many eggs, for so many something else. Yeah. And likewise, the 12, well, there's uh, 12 by 1, 4 by 3, 6 by 2. Again, if you're bartering. Yeah. So apparently, those two, those two units were actually in use by the common people for hundreds of years. We, we were suspect... having money they, for bartering purposes. So ah, they, I understand they, what you're saying. And it's, it's essentially the same reason as the fractions. The fractions split nicely, but that means you can cut them into parts in nice ways. Exactly. And it, it makes a lot of sense for a society that's developing. You can't, you can't sell half an egg. <laughs> <laughs> but we, even, we even had a, tw had a name for, the, for 12. A dozen. Mm. Perhaps. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. The last question from me, it's from Bill Kavanagh, actually. Um, Captain Bill, he wants to know, could you please tell us about the leap seconds? <laughs> okay. I'll do the leap seconds for you then. This is one of my favorite things. I've sort of told you a fib. Okay. So those of you who have studied science, maybe in secondary school, up to leaving cert level, if you've done physics, what you learn is, what is a second? And they tell you, oh, we have these complicated atomic clocks. And what you do is you trap a cesium atom and you do something strange to it. It makes its electron orbitals do th something funny. And then it emits radiation and you look at that radiation and you count 9,192,631,770 oscillations of that radiation. And that's one second. Okay. And so I've kind of fibbed to you why, if this is the definition of a second today, but I've told you a second is got by cutting a day into small pieces. What's going on here? There's, have I hoodwinked you? And the answer is no, I haven't really hoodwinked you. What happened was, how did they choose this number here? And they chose this number here by doing astronomical observations over about 150 years. So they took 150 years worth of astronomical data, measuring which way the Earth was facing in space against the best clocks that they had at that time. They discovered that they could do this thing with atoms, which produced super, super clocks. And they wanted to relate the day which was important to us to the seconds that they could measure with the atoms. But in the 70s, officially, but really since the 50s, they were able to line these two things up. So you have these seconds that click by atomically accurately, but we also have these seconds that relate to which way the Earth is facing in space. And it turns out that the Earth is falling behind the atomic seconds. So if you look at which way you think the Earth should be facing in space against how many atomic seconds have clicked by, what you see is the Earth is getting further and further and further behind the atomic seconds. And why is this? Well, this is kind of coming back to the astronomy again. They took 150 years worth of observations and they got the length of the day from 150 years. So the length of the day that they measured was in the middle of their 150 years worth of observations. And so by the time they used this data, the Earth had slowed down. Now, why had the Earth slowed down? And the answer is because the moon is stealing angular momentum from the Earth slowly. Okay, so this angular momentum thing comes back in. But this means gradually the Earth is facing the wrong direction relative to the atomic clock. But our clocks are supposed to tell us which way the Earth is facing in space. So they have come up with this compromise. The compromise is that we have international atomic time. That's called TAI. And we have universal time. That's what you get by doing your astronomy and measuring where the Earth is in space. And there is a compromise in between which is called Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. And what they do with UTC is 
every time you're more than a second out, what you do is you hold all the clocks on Earth, you give the Earth a chance to clock, catch up, and then you let the clocks go again, and then everything is good. So the graph goes from looking like this, where we're getting gradually further and further out, to looking like this. Now, this is all a very interesting thing, but it means every few years, we have to stop all the clocks on Earth for a second. And this is what a leap second is. So about every 18 months, maybe a little bit more. People got very anxious during this pe period here between about 2000 and 2006, where there weren't any leap seconds. And the problem is for normal people, this makes no difference. But for computers, a second is an eternity. And so this causes problems for com uh, uh, computers. So there's a very interesting debate, which has kind of gone off the boil. But starting about 1995, there was a debate, should we abandon the link between UTC, which is what we use for our calendar, and which way the Earth is facing? And of course, some of the astronomers think, why would you do that? The Earth is what we were trying to measure in the first place. Whereas other people are going, actually losing a second every few years is not so bad. We'll be able to fix it at some point by doing some kind of time zone fix. So this debate is simmering under the surface and I love watching it anyway. So this is what leap seconds are. And uh, yeah, depending on who you're talking to, they can be quite contentious. So there we go. That's my explanation <laughs> for Bill. Absolutely fantastic. And um really interesting because um, it doesn't really concern us, but a second, as uh, Professor Malone has said, is really important to the extent even that they're actually um, very strict about the, the type of connections they have in the stock exchange because they can actually make or lose billions in a second. So it affects us in more ways than we might think, but I really loved this talk. I learned a lot in a very entertaining manner. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Now I'm passing over to Declan. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, question from Colm. Do different timekeeping systems have to be established in locations such as northern Norway, where you either have 24 hours of daylight or 24 hours of darkness? That's a good question. So I, a lot of people try to adopt the time of whatever place if they're in a weird situation like that so antarctica is a similar situation people will often adopt the time zone of their home country to give themselves some kind of orientation so there is an interesting side to this which i don't know so much about that human beings are driven by daylight more than we realize so if people have ever had to do shift work or even had to get up early for a flight we know that it's really important to have kind of regular stuff in our light and our biology is driven by the light so light comes into our eyes, it affects the uh, pituitary gland in our black brain, that it produces uh, melatonin, which helps us go to sleep and helps us wake up. You might think that you know, when we're awake and asleep is not really that important, but actually daylight is important to humans. It, it's important to our biology in a way. People, this is why people have things like these sad disorders and things like this in the winter when they're not getting daylight to drive that biological part of our thing. So somehow having our days lined up with daylight is important. And I know it's challenging for people that don't get that kind of proper input, but I don't know exactly what the best procedures are that people have for dealing with that kind of thing. Okay. Um, Linda, a different Linda says, do you think our concept of tracking time will change with increasing dependency on technology and the digital R groups of 10 format, possibly? That's a good question. Calendars have been really, really resistant to reform on the scale of, say, people tried to institute a 10-day week once because instead of a seven-day week, because 10 is an easier number for us to work with. And it failed because... Uh, people took their holidays on a Sunday for church and people took their holidays on the fourth day, on the first day of every five day cycle as well. So people got extra holidays and they had to abandon it and go back to the old system, essentially. So there have been lots of attempts to do this kind of thing. The French tried to do French Revolution. They tried to do a revised calendar with 30 day uh, months with a regular system. And then they would put in extra days through the year to make, up the, make it up to 365. But that failed as well after a little bit. Um, so I think for some reason, times of they're so sort of meshed into society, they're quite hard to reform. So I don't know whether it'll ever, 
I suspect it will, it will take a long time for anything to happen. Bill wants to know, will we ever move to permanent daylight saving time? And I think there was some debate or discussion on this quite recently, wasn't there? Yeah, so the current state of affairs is that um, there was a large survey run in the, so the EU now regulates the summertime thing. They ran a large survey and they discovered that daylight savings time is not that popular, particularly in Germany, but also throughout the EU. The question is, what do you replace it with? And I don't think anybody has a good answer for that question. So the current state of affairs is that the European Parliament has voted to get rid of it. It's now with the Council of Ministers, and the job is that each country would have to figure out what it's going to do next. So Ireland ran a consultation, and the decision last time I heard from the Irish government was that they would not favour the ending of summertime because the UK will almost certainly keep it, and then we would have two time zones on the island again. But the situation, I think, is complicated because not all countries have decided what they want. And until you know what every country wants, you can't decide if the result would be better or worse than having daylight savings. Now, there are biological implications to it, too. We would be actually be better off not changing the clocks twice a year biologically because dragging yourself out of bed early in the spring is hard work. But the biology points to keeping wintertime actually all year round as the better solution biologically, at least for us in the nor northern half of Europe. The answer is, it's probably a political question, I don't know. Uh, just a quick point there, uh, David and et al. Um, in, in the spring, there's a 27% increase in heart attacks in, in uh, Western worlds, which uh, implement daylight saving time. And in the autumn, um, when we get an extra hour in bed, there's a 23%, so it's 23, not 27, 23% decrease in heart attacks. And that is uh, in a sample of 10,000. Yeah, so it's interesting. The biological stuff is really interesting. You have <clears throat> biological effects of the time zone. So they've done um, studies of people on either side of a time zone boundary in the US. So people living essentially in the same place, but one person is in one state in one time zone, the other person is in the just over the boundary. And what they've discovered is people in the extreme west of a time zone tend to be more overweight, they're more likely to suffer from diabetes, and they're more subject to certain types of cancer even. And they think it's to do with the uh, melatonin regulation stuff going on, and because it's a antioxidant of some sort and has, I don't understand the effects, I'm not a biologist, but there's weird measurable stuff that people are doing there, which is really, really interesting. Can I, can I just pitch in here? This is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, because it seems to me that this time business, it's all the result of the 18th century aristocracy showing off how many candles they could, in, they could afford and starting the, hab of the fashion of going to bed at midnight. Because before then, everyone used to go to bed at 8 o'clock and get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Now, maybe I've got that wrong, but that's the way I see it. And now, now we're all following the habits of the 18th century aristocracy. And we're all, we're all burning the midnight oil, literally or figuratively. And we should stop doing it. We should go to bed at 8 o'clock. We should get up at 4. And midday should actually be the middle of the day instead of about three quarters of the way through the morning. <laughs> That's the end of my hobby horse. Uh, next question from Helen O'Brien. What's the most accurate calendar from the past that you've come across from the time of the Roman Republic or even before? It really depends what you want to track. So if you want to track the, say, the spring equinox, our calendar is actually pretty good. There are some suggestions for modifications to it, which would be even better. So you would have a 4,000-year leap year rule as well as a 400-year one. If you want to track the moon, you definitely want a different calendar for our one. So I guess the Islamic calendar is really nice in terms of the moon because they strictly, the month starts on the observation of the moon at Mecca. I think it's Mecca, isn't it? And they have a lot of astronomy around predicting when the moon will, the month will start because the question of when a month starts is then an observational question. Uh, so that's really quite nice compared to what we have. So you have to pick the right calendar for the right job, I think. Paul Campbell is wondering, is it true that from 1880 to 1916, 
somebody traveling from Hollyhead to Dublin would have to move their watch back by 25 minutes when they arrived in Ireland. Yes, apparently the clocks on the ferries, or the steamboats I think as they were at the time, had uh, two minute hands, one for the Dublin time and one for Hollyhead time. And in fact, even more bizarrely, the mail coaches that went back and forth carried a chronometer, so a watch, back and forth between the UK and Dublin every day up to, I think, sometime in the 50s, which is extraordinary to sort of check time alignment on either side. It's, it's wonderful things, you know, mechanical stuff that we don't need to do anymore, but was a delight when it was done. Question from Paul Campbell. Uh, were you concerned about Y2K as we came to the millennium? Yeah, so I followed that at the time. I mentioned I was helping look after computers in Trinity. So at that stage, I was still helping with the computers. And we did go through a careful procedure. And we checked everything. And we found some things. I don't think we found much stuff that would have broken badly. But we found things like old email software that was still writing two-digit dates. Um, log files where we were recording the data. But we were recording two-digit dates in the data. And so we went around and we fixed all that stuff. And uh, our time server kept worked perfectly through the thing. There was actually, a, I think there was a leap second too, was there? No, mate, perhaps the leap second was a different year. But everything behaved as it should. That was very nice. Um, the time I'm vaguely dreading is there's a date in 2038 when a lot of computers are going to have trouble because it's two to the power of 31 seconds since the 1st of January 1970 which is when an awful lot of computers are counting from, and we may have another issue then. But that will be actually about the year I retire, so I'm hoping I can make a large amount of consultancy money or something to see the end of my retirement. Yeah, there was certainly a, a, a lot of hype about it. Um, I was in the water industry at the time, and I remember getting these letters from various um, state departments saying, can you guarantee that the cars we bought from you will still function at a second past midnight in the year 2000? <laughs> yeah, my mother was what. So my mother was a hospital physicist, and she was watching equipment in the hospital as the new year ticked over to make sure everything was okay. And I think there was a big effort, and as consequently, I'm one of the people who believes there was a big effort, and we actually caught most of the problems before they happened. Uh, Dorothea is wondering, why isn't there 13 months of 28 days? That is an excellent question. What would that turn out to be? Let me, uh, I can't multiply by 13 in my head, unfortunately. So 13 times 28, 364, that would be very good, wouldn't it? I suppose it must be uh, a multiple of seven. So it must be one day off a normal year. So you'd have to do a little bit of correction around that. I, honestly, I don't know for sure why it's not used by anybody. I guess it's not great as a lunar one. It would be okay as a solar one if you had some kind of leap year system around it. but. I think the answer is historical accidents is the, explains a shockingly large amount about the calendar. So, so David, no one has tried that, Not that I know What of, about the Islamic calendar? Doesn't the Islamic calendar have 13 months? It does, but it tracks the uh, moon so closely that it's not going to be 28 days. So their calendar drifts with respect to the solar year, and they have a different way of fixing that problem. They have a leap month system for that, I think. Now, I know I'm slightly more uh, familiar with the Jewish calendar, and it has a leap month system, so I think the Islamic calendar is kind of similar in that respect, but I don't know the details off the top of my head. That, that kind of segues into the next question from Daily S06. Uh, do you know any countries successfully running different time clock systems? As far as I know, it, it, extraordinarily, the, the European system for both the time of day and the at least calendar for business seems to have trumped nearly everything else. But of course, we know, you know, we see the Chinese New Year at different times of year. Traditional calendars are different and all kinds of people have more interesting calendars for sort of more traditional purposes. Uh, we were talking about Y2K a moment ago and Paul Campbell is wondering, is it 2000 or 2001 is the first year of the 21st century? Hmm. I think it's the latter, isn't it? I think technically it is probably the latter, but I'm happy to take a celebration whenever everybody wants one. So <laughs> and with the whole, they missed the year zero at the start and they probably didn't put the yeah. year one in the right place. Great. I don't think we should lose too much sleep. <laughs> okay. Uh, technical question from Steve O'Flynn. 
What's the smallest unit of time? Planck time? I think there is a, so in the sense that there's a Planck scale, which you can stop measuring lengths in quantum mechanics, there's essentially, a, there's also a Planck time, which corresponds to where you lose track of how much energy you have in the universe very quickly. And it's a very short amount of time. So I think effectively you can say that from a sort of standard physics -y point of view that you can use this Planck time as the shortest time that's likely to be interesting to anybody. And the last question uh, from John Burgess, it's a two part, but I think we've just answered the, the second part there on Y2K. Uh, so he says, when you think of the automated time updates program into our electronic devices, how far ahead are leap years programmed in, considering the life of the IT technology embedded in our controls? That's a really very good question. And this is one of the things that I actually worry a little bit about with the uh, abandoning daylight savings time thing. So if we abandon it, the rules for leap years change. The way that compute, the way most computers know how to change the time is, there are a group of people who are shockingly interested in calendars and they have an emailing list somewhere on the internet and they maintain a thing called the Olson database, which is called so because a guy called Olson put it together originally. And he collected information about time zones all around the year, all around the world, and how they worked in different years. So for instance, they know all the details about um, when Ireland changed in 1916 and we put our clocks back by 35 minutes. It knows all that stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they maintain this database. It's incorporated into all the operating systems. So your iPhone knows about this, your Mac knows about this your Android phone knows about this, your Linux servers know about this, even like set-top boxes and TVs often now because they're based on Linux will have this thing built into them. And this thing knows the rule that I told you for, uh, that the EU came up with. So the EU said last Sunday in March, last Sunday in October, we changed the clocks. So as long as that rule is there, all those devices will get it right. Okay. If we change our minds, the guys on the Olson time zone list will update it immediately, but then you've got to get that update to all the computers around the world so that they know what the time is going to be in all the different countries across Europe. I'm just a bit worried about the prospect of doing that in any small amount of time. I reckon that's a five to 10 year job. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting one from Helen uh, Mulcahy, which is what time would be used, is used on the space station or if you were on the moon? That is a great question. And the answer is, I don't, I know they have a system for the space station. Mm. So on the moon, nobody's been there long enough for it to be, become a really important question. The space station does have its own time zone and they have shifts and stuff. And I think they might not run it on 24 hours. Does anybody know? Because somebody may well know better than me on a group like this. Ah, uh, universal time. I thought it was uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Okay, so that's it then. Uh, I, I will look that one up because that's one I should yeah, do because I'm answer. not quite certain, but I have a feeling it's universal time, as they say. Okay. Okay. David, I'm acutely conscious of the fact that I promised that we'd only keep you here for quarter past nine. <laughs> and you're about you're you're probably about twenty-five minutes past the time. Plus the fact I know you've probably been doing Zoom meetings all day, lecturing your undergraduates or whatever you do up at Main Earth. So I haven't I had too many Zoom meetings today, thankfully. So I have, I, I'm going relatively strong. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. And we're, we're extremely grateful to you. But I don't think we should trespass on your time any longer. I, I'm absolutely delighted to have met you. I'm hoping that uh, we might have the chance to welcome you in person to Cork one day in the not too distant future. But I think as far as tonight's concerned, I think the time is well overdue. <laughs> When we, we, when we should thank you for your fascinating talk and th th this, this even more fascinating uh, question session, which has been uh, both entertaining and enlightening in, in equal quantities. Thank um, you. But uh, I, I, I think it's time to, I think it's really is time to start the meeting now because otherwise we could go to 10 o'clock and I would be acutely embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, I think probably the time has uh, come to say goodnight to each other now. Thanks ever so much, David. We, we really appreciate your time, which is the most re relevant word in the circumstances. <laughs>
and uh, we certainly look forward to seeing you again sometime and maybe not, not, not in this virtual fashion. So thanks very much.